Hi AP Chemistry students, it's Mrs. Johnson and we're starting with the chapter 5 notes on gases. So in each of this, um, the sections of the notes I've tried to put the associated textbook reading and I encourage you if this is new to you, use your textbook as a resource to help you understand the content. So to start with, um, a barometer uses the height of a column of mercury to measure gas pressure, especially when we're talking about atmospheric pressure. So let me explain how this old school barometer would work. There are gas molecules in the air all around us. They're bouncing off you and me and whatever desk you're sitting at. And they would bounce off this uh, container of mercury as well. If there's lots of gas particles pressing downward on this container of mercury, the mercury in the tube is going to rise to a higher level. The higher the reading in the tube, the higher the atmospheric pressure or the pressure of the gas particles is pushing down on this tube. Okay. That's how old school barometers used to work, and the units, the, the, the first pressure units that we're going to talk about are derived from this. So millimeters of mercury is one of the units of pressure that we'll discuss in class. It's not the most commonly discussed, but mmHg. millimeters of mercury comes from this device where you would read the height of the column of mercury in the tube. The other gas unit that we're going to see is Tor, also known as, um, or named after, excuse me, Torricelli, the scientist who came up with this stuff. The unit that we're going to most frequently use in AP Chemistry is ATM or atmospheres, and then kilopascals is another unit of pressure. This is the SI unit. Okay, again, ATM is the most common. So when we are talking about gases, um, these are the units that you'll use. The numbers that I have associated with these are there for a specific reason. All of these values represent atmospheric pressure at sea level. So in Connecticut, we are pretty close to sea level. We can assume that on an average day, we'd be experiencing one ATM of pressure, or 760 millimeters of mercury um, would be the pressure that we'd be feeling. Obviously, as you move upward in the atmosphere, so if you went up into a plane, um, the atmosphere at higher heights, oh, excuse me, the atmospheric pressure at higher heights is less because the gas mo molecules are more spread out. Okay, so <clears throat> when we are working with gases in problems, I want you to be picturing something in your head. If you can draw a picture in your head and manipulate that picture, um, it will help you understand the concepts because remember, it's not just numbers and words on a page. We always want to be thinking in terms of particles. So here's how we're going to envision gases. You've got a container, and this container has a lid on it, and my drawing is going to be terrible. And this lid has a movable piston on it, or has a, excuse me, has a handle on it, so that we can move the height of the lid up and down. Okay, sometimes you may be holding the height of the lid constant, sometimes you may be moving the lid downward or decreasing the volume. Sometimes you might be expanding the volume by moving, raising the lid upward, but that's how we're going to picture it. And then in our little chamber, we're going to draw some gas molecules. So I'm going to draw five small gas molecules. It doesn't really matter how many you draw. Actually, I'll draw four, and I'm going to call these gases hydrogen gas. And hydrogen, to be totally correct, is diatomic. So I am going to draw H2 molecules in here. Whatever your identity of the gas is, it doesn't really matter, as long as you have one gas that you're picturing in your mind. Okay, so we're always going to envision our gas in a chamber like this, and then we're going to use this set of five assumptions called the kinetic molecular theory, or KMT, to dictate how we think about gases. Now, this set of assumptions doesn't 100% always work. There are certain conditions under which the assumptions break down, but for starting, we're going to pretend that these 100% work all the time. So we're going to pretend that these gases always act ideally as we build up our understanding. So just like if you took physics, you start in a world with no friction, right? You pretend that friction doesn't exist even though you know it's there, you know it's causing issues. Um, same thing here, we start with these set of assumptions and then we know that there are conditions that cause these assumptions to be invalid. So number one, we're going to assume that the gas, gas particles have or do not take up any space. Maybe you drew your gas particles gigantic and they're taking up 90% of the space in your container. Uh, we're going to assume that no matter how you drew them, they take up zero space. If this is a one liter container, we've got one liter in which we can add stuff to. So they have a volume of zero liters. We are also going to assume that gas particles are in constant motion. And when we talk about pressure, 
we are talking about two factors related to the motion of the particles. The first one is how often the walls of this container are struck by the gas particles. So these particles are moving around, they're bouncing, they are hitting the walls of the container. The frequency with which they hit is a, um, a measure of their pressure. If they hit a lot, we'd say it's at high pressure. We're also gonna look at how forcefully they hit the walls. If we were to heat up our gas particles, you can imagine that they're gonna bounce around more often and hit more forcefully and more frequently the walls of the container. In that case, we'd be experiencing an increase in the pressure. Number three, we're gonna assume that the particles have no attractive or repulsive forces between them and collisions are completely elastic. So even though we know intermolecular forces exist, we're gonna assume that these, wall, these molecules bounce into each other and the walls of the container and they bounce right back. Because if the particles started sticking together, that would be less movement and that would cause a decrease in pressure. We assume that that's never gonna happen though. Number four, we assume the only thing that changes the kinetic energy of gas molecules is the temperature. Remember, if you took physics, kinetic energy is one half mv squared, mass times velocity squared. For our purposes, we assume that temperature is what affects the kinetic energy of the particles. Number five, the pressure exerted by a gas does not depend on the identity of the gas. So I'm gonna add in another gas here. I'm gonna add in some red particles. And I'm gonna draw these, try to draw these larger. So I have four molecules of hydrogen gas. I'm gonna draw in four larger molecules. And I'm gonna call this argon gas. Argon is a much bigger molecule than uh, hydrogen gas, H2, but we are gonna assume that because just because argon's bigger, it doesn't act any differently than hydrogen. There's four molecules of argon that are bouncing off the walls of the container, four molecules of hydrogen, they're gonna both exert equal pressure, okay? Assuming that the temperature is not changing, um, that the number of particles isn't changing, we can treat these exactly the same in terms of the pressure that they exert. Okay. So let's move forward and continue talking about some of the assumptions with gases. The first law that we're going to discuss is Boyle's law. Boyle's law involves pressure and volume. And when we're talking about Boyle's law, we're assuming temperature is constant. So Boyle used these J tubes, put mercury in them, um, and created a little pocket of gas over here. So Boyle saw that as the mercury increased, the pocket of gas got smaller right, because the pressure in the tube is increasing. So as the volume decreases, the gas particles hit the wall more often, because remember there is atmospheric gas trapped over here. We can't see the particles, but they're hitting the walls more often as he increases the amount of mercury in the tube, thus there's an increase in pressure. So volume goes down, pressure goes up. And we can see that in our picture of our gas container. If you move this lid downward, the particles get more crowded together, so of course they're gonna hit the walls more often, causing an increase in pressure. If we were to plot out pressure versus volume for a gas at a constant temperature, you got V on the x-axis, P on the y-axis, we would get this shape. This is a hyperbolic shape, but it should make sense that as pressure increases, or excuse me, as volume is increasing, that must be um, also associated with a decrease in pressure. One thing to note is that if we multiply the pressure and the volume of a gas sample at any given temperature, we should get a K constant, or get a constant value that we're gonna call K. So as the pressure increases, volume must be <coughs> decreasing, but the, the multiplication of the two would give us that K constant. Let's look at this graph though. We just said that an ideal gas, our perfect world gases, are expected to have a constant value of pressure times volume, assuming that temperature doesn't change. And that's what we've got plotted here. We've got pressure on the x-axis and then PV on the y. Here would be an ideal gas, constant uh, PV value even as the pressure changes, right? We should see a flat line. However, there's three different samples of gases and neither of them, no, none of the three, um, have a perfectly constant value of PV. Which one shows the largest deviation in PV? Hopefully you're seeing that that's CO2. We get a, a big deviation from that ideal value, that ideal constant, as the pressure increases. 
The reason for that is partly related to intermolecular forces, which we'll talk about. Um, the more stickiness, or the more sticking together that we get of CO2 molecules, the bigger the deviation that we get. So intermolecular forces definitely cause issues with our, our kinetic molecular theory assumptions. But does this affect our use of Boyle's law and the gas laws and the math that we're going to be doing? No, it doesn't. So how does this data affect our use? it doesn't really affect it at all. Because if you check out these y-axis, the way it's numbered, right, these are tiny increments. So even CO2 that looks like it's having a huge deviation, it's really not that gigantic of a deviation. So we can still use our math and our stuff, uh, our math to make assumptions and pretty good estimations of values. Okay, Boyle's Law really breaks down the most at certain pressures. So ask yourself, is high pressure or low pressure going to be more non-ideal or cause a bigger breakdown in our, our assumptions. Hopefully you realize just by looking at the graphs, these deviations get higher or larger at high pressures. So high pressures are non-ideal conditions. This is really important. At high pressures, we have gas particles that are going to be bouncing into each other a lot. As particles bounce into each other a lot, they're going to be more likely to stick together, maybe even condensing to a liquid. Um, that causes big deviations in our assumptions. Okay, so high pressure is not great for our math, uh, but we continue to assume that we're working at low pressures. Okay, another law about gases is Charles' law. Charles' law deals with volume and temperature, and we're assuming that pressure is held constant. So when a gas is heated up, particle speed is going to change. So let's look at our picture over here. Assuming that this lid is movable, right? If I were to light a flame under this gas container, the only way to keep pressure constant would be for the size of the container to increase. So as temperature goes up, the volume must go up in order to keep pressure constant. So particle speed increases when I heat up a gas. Particles are going to hit the walls more often and with more force. The only way to keep the pressure constant is to increase the volume of the container. So here we've got plots of temperature on the x-axis and volume. And you can see that as temperature increases, volume of a container is going to increase. We see a linear plot here. We've got lots of different graph or lots of different gases. So the dashed line represents the extrapolation of the data into regions where the gases would normally come to condense together to be liquids or solids. What temperature, what is the temperature when the volume extrapolates down to absolute zero here? What temperature do we have? Hopefully you realize that, one second, Oh, sorry. What is the, <laughs> this is, should be opposite. What is the volume when the temperature extrapolates down to absolute zero? So at absolute zero, negative 273.2 Celsius or zero Kelvin, we assume that the volume of a gas is zero. But I have a question for you. Why does the helium line extend almost all the way down to absolute zero? Whereas all these other lines have to be extrapolated, meaning they become a liquid before they hit even close to absolute zero. Helium is the only one on here that is a noble gas. It's the one that experiences the least intermolecular forces, or the weakest intermolecular forces the weakest attractions to other molecules, so it's going to take the most energy, or excuse me, the lowest temperature to condense. And we'll talk a lot more about that in the future. And finally, the last thing that we'll talk about is the ideal gas law. There's four quantities that we need to describe a gas, and we'll start looking at problems in class or with your homework. The first quantity is the number of moles of a gas. So N is how we abbreviate that, and that means number moles of gas. Right, lots of moles of gas, we're gonna have probably a lot of pressure in a container. Temperature of a gas, T, and the units that we're always gonna use are Kelvin in our problems. Volume of a gas, we represent V, and we're gonna use liters, not milliliters. And then pressure of a gas, P, and we're mostly gonna use ATM for this. So if you combine several other gas laws that you may have learned in your previous classes, you get the ideal gas law. 
PV equals nRT, or the product of pressure and volume, is equal to the number of, molecule, number of gas moles times the temperature at which they're held times R, some gas constant. So the units of R, R is a constant that you will always be given. Units are liters times ATM per mole Kelvin. Or the other way that you could write this is liters ATM mole to the negative one, Kelvin to the negative one. Okay, and this law is useful for ideal gases only, which we're always gonna assume that we're working with ideal gases. So we'll pick up here in class.